Yeah, very good afternoon for all of you. It's a big honor for us to welcome uh, Professor Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker. He's one of the most prominent uh, and known personalities on the globe um, on sustainability, on environmental sciences, but not only from a scientific perspective, as well from a technological, innovative perspective, a political view, a societal view, the international context, and from the philosophical uh, foundations. The title of our Afternoon of the Future is A New Enlightenment is Needed to Our Full World. In German, Aufklärung. Eine neue Aufklärung, a new enlightenment. And almost exactly a year ago, you visited us for the first afternoon of the future, uh, at October, um, that was um, actually 29, 2020, and the title a year ago was the topic Living Space Earth. We need quality innovations for our future. So it's a common challenge and a common, a common uh, opportunity for science, politics, economy, society, and this responsibility for our common future we share. I like to start with the final sentence of your last year, the discussion we had, the interview, at our GLF TV studio, so good mood Fortwangen. We need good mood, we need to be optimistic. And um, I like to um, start with your last words a year ago. Ich habe jetzt noch eine abschließende Frage. Glauben Sie, die Vernunft wird siegen? Ach, ich bin irgendwo Optimist von meinem Charakter her. Ich denke schon, wenn die Vernunft als das erkannt wird, was uns hilft, das Richtige zu machen, dann wird sie doch wohl siegen. Okay. Herzlichen Dank für Ihr großes Engagement für unsere Zukunft. Dankeschön. And that's actually today's topic, the new enlightenment. Uh, reason-based, Vernunft-basiert. Professor Schofer, our president of Fort Wang University, I'd also like to welcome uh, Andrea Linke, our chancellor. Um, he pointed it out during our first day of sustainability. Sustainability is the future topic of our society and thus the future topic of our university. And here, just a little portfolio. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We can look back on more than 170 years of successful education and innovation, starting in 1850 with the German Clockmaker School. And the German Clockmaker School was introduced here in Fort Wangen because at those days, here was the heart of the German clock industry, 3,000 people employed in that industry. And to keep the innovation going, the innovation and the quality innovations, they're depending on the, the young talents. The school at those days was introduced. And nowadays, we have 6,500 students here at the main Fortwang campus in Schwenningen, our international business school and medical and mechanical engineering, and the newest campus in Tutlingen which is basically the world headquarter, uh, we say, for medical instruments, our third campus, where our students, they, are, they study, they become smart, but they apply it with the organizations, with the companies, and responsibly. And uh, just a few examples uh, of, a, of a big bouquet of activities that take place every day in a lecture, in a seminar, workshop, thesis, research activity, which is often linked to the challenges we read every day in the newspaper in the area of social, economic, and ecologic development. And that's what we really need, basically to be book smart and street smart, to look at the world and how we can contribute later in our positions in industry, in society, in organizations, and private life. 
for a good future. And we have in our mission statement dedicated, it's very strongly anchored in the mission statement of Hotman University to contribute, to have our responsibility to the sustainable development, to a good future in, in these fields. And just some examples, like a dear colleague, Andreas Fahrt, Professor Fahrt, he's a triathlete, so he has been swimming through the Rhine from the Bodensee to the North Sea, taking water probes yeah, for microplastics that end up in the fish and it, it ends up in humans, in us, with all the effects. Um, at our business faculty, Professor Frank Kramer, he's uh, with us today as well. He's teaching the, the business students sustainable economics. Yeah? Not the quarterly results, sustainable economics that really creates values responsibly. And so on. Yeah, we have got uh, in our um, security, society and health uh, faculty, for example, a lab for ambient assisted living. If I break my leg when I ski and I, I live in an apartment, I might need assistance, technological-wise, and with a helping human hand for a couple of weeks, where I else would have to move somewhere else. And of course, and I'd really like to welcome our Good Mood uh, Fortwangen uh, TV, our wonderful digital media team, Ada Rode. Uh, the media is so important. The media is an echo camera nowadays. And the media can do a lot of good things to make us aware, to attach us to situations as they are and how we can improve and contribute um, in our, uh, on our job, private life, and in society. We call that Campus in Action. That's the logo, Campus in Action. It's in the colors of the UN 17 sustainability goals. These are only 16 letters, so one color is missing, but the 17 goals. So from knowledge to action, campus in action. Already during the studies, and then you have got the wings to fly through a life of decades as self-responsible uh, personalities on your job, again, in society and in family. And we'd like to bring the root dedically very close to you. Campus in action. Now today, last year, uh, the event was in German. This time in English. Because, uh, as you know here on campus, we are an international campus. Our international students are very much welcome here in the audience. And the live streaming, so people are watching us around the globe. And um, so you got to get the opportunity to have a semester abroad. We welcome our international semester. That's my responsibility as the president um, representative for the international uh, campus here in, in Fort Wangen. Our international students. And often that link creates a sustainable relationship to that student and to the university in order to approach things together. And therefore in English, yeah, so that we can use this very precious afternoon to connect even stronger in the, our ambition towards sustainability with our partner universities. So I see it, what happens today here, as an event and knowledge and an experience that is basically, in my view, timeless. Uh, to finish up my introduction, before I welcome a bit more in detail Professor Hans Ulrich von Weizsäcker, uh, science and humanity. The topic today complements last year's topic. So last year it was about we need quality innovations for our future. And Professor von Weizsäcker, uh, with colleagues in Australia, he has um, developed a concept. It's called Factor 5 how the world economy can be put on a trajectory path which is five times more resource efficient. Five, it could be eight times, that's a lucky number. In, in China, it could be a hundred times. Say time, 10 times if you've got an LED and change a light bulb to an LED, you have to factor 10. Yeah? The, the idea behind this is, but the concept uh, that with one kilowatt 
hour of power, you can achieve much more than nowadays, or with one kilo of steel. And that has to do with innovation. That has to do a lot with what we do in our engineer faculties and with the companies in the Black Forest LTD. So for our international audience, the Black Forest here is a wonderful and world-famous tourist region. We have the world-famous Black Forest cake, the ghetto that we like so much. But the Black Forest LTD, under one roof, are 1,500 enterprises. And these enterprises are often hidden champions. It, most of it started from the wheels of the clock. And nowadays, it's on the future of mobility, on the future of health, on the future of energy. In, in all of these areas, and much, much more, 1,500 co companies uh, ranging, for example, from endoscopic uh, equipment, so taking for operations, yeah, endoscopically a, a picture and the image processing to the sensor intelligence uh, of the future. And um, I had the opportunity through SAP, the Next Generation um, program, in New York, uh, got an invitation this year to the World Economic Forum, which takes place yearly in Switzerland in Davos. Not to the forum itself, but around the forum are a lot of activities going on by uh, the, the biggest uh, companies and organizations in the world. And uh, during the visit, January 21 to 24, I got in touch with IBM, and then it was a very unique for me meeting, a, a lunch meeting, 150 um, attendees with the CEO of IBM. And the topic was quantum computing. So that's a quantum computer, and Professor Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker knows the quantum theory very well. So the quantum theory ranges back now, like uh, the knowledge, like 90 years from now, 90 to 100 years. And now, this will lead, you can be sure, in the next 10 to 20 years to completely new power for certain areas of computing. More power means 100 million times faster than now, computers nowadays, which opens up, of course, huge opportunities for us, for the challenges, if we make an analysis about a forecast, how the, the rivers flow in the air, or for a disease in life science to much, much quicker provide results for certain cell probes, which now take three weeks and it might then take two minutes. Yeah? So uh, that's the, the, the quantum computing by IBM and also Google. And um, I was standing there at IBM, I had the, the book uh, with me of Professor Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker uh, to the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome celebrated 50 years two years ago, and that's the report to the Club of Rome. And also in Davos, 50 years in Davos, and sustainability, that was a very, very big topic. The young people, the students, and the pupils, they are in movement. They like to act based on scientific knowledge. Yeah, Greta was there also last year. It's a big movement, and what the young people they pledge for, and that's their human right to say, let us approach the future based on scientific knowledge. And just a couple of days ago, October 7, CRISPR-Cas9, another potentially disruptive uh, innovation, a complete disruptive possibility, the gene editing. So they, the two ladies got the Nobel Prize, Emmanuel Charpentier, who's director at the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, and Jennifer Dudner, who is a professor at Berkeley University. But this can't be adopted in a naive, crazy, optimistic way. It has to be adopted wisely, because these technologies also have the shadow side. So the new enlightenment um, is the topic of today's afternoon. And Professor Ernst Ulrich von Weizsäcker, it's a very big honor for us that we can have this afternoon the future together, um, that um, you came to Fort Wangen. Um, as I stated at the beginning, you are one of the top personalities in the, in the world in this field. And uh, I would say at the very top, 
because your knowledge and responsibilities over decades covers all areas. So starting, for example, only a few things I mentioned here. The director of the UN Center for Science and Technology for Development in New York, then also responsibilities internationally in Europe uh, in Bonn. The founding president of the Wuppertal Institute for Climate, Environment and Energy, uh, a member um, of the German Bundestag, the German Parliament, then um, several years in the US, six or seven years as dean of the Donald Brand School for Environmental Science and Management of the University of California, Santa Barbara, and as well the co-president uh, for several years of the Club of Rome. Limits of growth, 50 years ago. If we continue like this, if we don't, if we pr produce a car, for example, the same way and we fly the same ways as, as in the past, they predicted 50 years ago we need four or five planets at least. So it's our common responsibility, and this is, um, I like to make a final citation uh, on TV. Um, September 1st, this year, you stated, as a civilization, we have to think uh, about the well-being of our future generations as well, and not always about ourselves. Our sincere welcome from heart to Fort Wang University, the, the home of the, the clocks, and you can say also in some way the home of time, and time is our most precious resource, and it's time to act. Thank you, and I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you. Meine Präsentation ist ja. direkt dahinter. Ja. ja. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Achim Karluk, for this lovely introduction. I was asked also to speak English today, and but I'm rushing through the oh thank you. Uh, discussion. As he said, the Club of Rome became famous some 50 years ago with the publication The Limits to Growth. That's the team that did it. And the most famous graph from that pic uh, book was this one. In particular, the green line, shocking message the depletion of natural resources, which was actually wrong, but nevertheless, it made an, had a big impact. Actually, there was another pessimistic mistake in the limits to growth, the one I mentioned, and the other is, at the time, in 1972, they assumed, empirically correct, that pollution would go absolutely mathematically hand in hand with industrial output, which was wrong. I mean, it was true that time, but then we had pollution control measures and laws all over the world, in particular in the rich countries. And so the book had two major errors. In addition, it did not address the things that we are discussing today, like climate. Climate that didn't occur in the limits to growth. And then the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, the sustainability discussion, was not there. The Anthropocene, globalization, the rise of China, the digitalization, and the unbridled power of financial markets. This is today's challenge, but it was not existing in the limits of growth. Nevertheless, the basic message that there are limits of growth in a limited planet, Earth, uh, is still correct. Anders Wickman, my Swedish friend, and I were co-presidents of the Club of Rome from 2012 to 18, and we felt it was absolutely necessary now to write a new major report to the Club of Rome, or by the Club of Rome, on the challenges of today. 
And that's the book, Come On. I'm going into it in a moment. It was translated into many languages, including Chinese and Japanese, etc., and essentially tries to answer the challenges that are the challenges of our days. I mean, COVID-19 was not included yet because it was published in 2018. A very important part of the philosophical discussion in Come On was the distinction between the empty world and the full world. That was a distinction postulated by the then um, chief economist of the World Bank, of whom you would not assume that he is a greenish dreamer. But he said, just realistically, if we look into the challenges of the day, we better make this, this, this distinction. You know, a hundred years ago, let alone a thousand years ago, there were few people, little economic turnover, and nature was healthy and large. But today, since 1950 roughly, the world is full of humans and full of consumption by humans and acquisition by humans of all of nature. That's the full world. A disaster for nature. But nobody talks about that. Everybody t talks about technological progress. Fine, okay. So, from the empty world originated the adoration of growth. Of course. Of course. If the world is empty, why not grow? All of our instincts, I mean, in the Stone Age, it was necessary to look for oneself and to grab from nature what is there. All the languages of the world, the European Enlightenment, and indeed population increase. In the empty world, that's fine. In the full world, it's not. Clearly, some of the empty world concepts are outdated. Herman Daly gives one example, quite striking, about the economy of fishery. He said, if you are in the, in the empty world and you want more fish, what will you do? Well, more fishermen, more nets, more boats, you have more, more fish. As simple as that. But if you are living in the full world, you have to do the opposite. Big, big marine protection zones with fishing highly restricted, if not forbidden. Otherwise, you simply eradicate the rest of the fish, and then it's finished. And then fish farming, and save the female fish, because in those fish, Female fish are the eggs for next generation. Okay, almost the opposite recipes uh, from those valid in the empty world. So this distinction is absolutely crucial for understanding the negative side of the full world. But that's not very popular, I have to say. Well, the book has three chapters. First chapter, come on, don't tell me the current trends are sustainable. They are not. You know, in English language, come on, typically in the everyday language, means don't be stupid. And the second part is, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies. And the third part is, come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world totally different meaning of come on. I mean, the German publisher had the ingenious idea of making the title Wir sind dran, which is equally um, ambiguous. I say that in German. Wir sind dran means 
It's our turn. And wir sind dran. We will be the victims unless we do it right. Okay. So, let's go through them. Well, I mentioned population increase. It's at the core of the full world problems. And then, uh, this picture I was using the day before yesterday in Japan. The Japanese are pioneers in stabilization of population. And in this picture you see it's from the United Nations Fund for Population Activities. From left to right, the population increase in certain areas of the world, the highest, Sub-Saharan Africa, and from bottom to top, economic success. Well, it's quite clear. Those parts of the world that managed to stabilize their population, chiefly East Asia, but Western Europe is also quite good, they were the big winners. And Sub-Saharan Africa is an economic disaster after they have sold all their natural resources to China. The full world is now called the Anthropocene which essentially means 65 years of explosive acceleration. This can't go on any longer. But exponential growth is what all governments of the world want for their own country. They want to destroy the nature. Of course, they never say so. The green curves are the answers of nature. And the higher, the more damaging, including carbon dioxide uh, concentrations. Well, one measure about the Anthropocene is the body weights of land-living vertebrates. There are three categories. Our domesticated animals, essentially our slaughter animals, you know. We eat them. And then humans, we are also vertebrates. And then the wild animals. And here you see the percentage point. Two-thirds of the body weights of vertebrates are our slaughter animals. Period. And nearly one-third is we ourselves. And three percent is left for the wild animals. So, this is the full world which is empty of wild animals. As simple as that. Do you learn that at school? I hardly believe. We try to hide the truth because it is so embarrassing. Well, we could have called our book Policies for the Anthropocene. Okay, unsustainable are, of course, the climate horrors. The real scare, however, is hardly ever mentioned. It's the sea level rise. In an Italian uh, uh, school book, I saw this picture of the coastline 20,000 years ago during the last ice age. In German, we call it the Wurm Ice site, when Italy was a lot larger than today. But during the last hot age, two million years ago, Italy was half as uh, large as today. And now imagine that we are running into a hot age. What does that mean, not exactly for Furtwangen, but for Hamburg, Amsterdam, or Florida, or Bangladesh, or um, much of Italy, of course, and um, about one and a half billion people living directly at the coast. You know? And the rise can occur rapidly. We were very lucky over the last seven, seven million years that the sea level was relatively stable. But in the eighth millennium before today, there was a rapid 
That was the end of the Wurm Ice site, of the last ice age. And during that time, a great part of the ice covering North America and partly Europe and the Himalaya, etc., was disappearing, flowing into the ocean. And I, Asia's vibrant growth centers are mostly at the coast. Some um, 800 million people in Asia alone. Okay, let's then switch to part two. Come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies. For that, we found a huge encouragement in our thinking from Pope Francis. His encyclical letter, Laudato Si, of 2015, names the huge dangers to our common home from the current modes of the economy. Ruthless competition, short-termism, utilitarian dogma. This is what rules our civilizations worldwide. There's not a single exemption. I mean, until five years ago or so, Bhutan was the exemption. But that's gone. In the meantime, they also want to be Americans, you know. And then we looked at the correctness of quoting the heroes of the old enlightenment, like Adam Smith, the invisible hand, like David Ricardo, the comparative advantages of international trade, and Charles Darwin, the struggle for life. Okay. But we found out they are all massively in misinterpreted and abused to legitimate destructive growth. For Adam Smith, the geographical reach of the markets, he called that the invisible hand, was identical with the geographical reach of the law and the state. And then it's okay. But today, markets are global and blackmail the states to maximize returns on investment. I mean, when I was Member of Parliament, I noticed very strongly how Wall Street effects forced us in Germany to reduce Social Security because Social Security diminishes the returns on investment of capital. It's a brutal blackmail going on by globalized financial markets. I mean, Adam Smith would turn in his grave if he was seeing how people would chant hymns on Adam Smith, the holy guru of, uh, inter uh, of um, the markets, but abusing that in order to destroy the state. But this is exactly what in the Anglo-Saxon mentality is dominant. They don't like the state. They don't like regulation. They want deregulation, liberalization, privatization, etc. This is what they consider progress. For David Ricardo, capital was not moving across borders. Across borders would the traders go and their goods and uh, they would create those comparative advantages. But today, capital is racing around the world in milliseconds and it is enslaving the real eco economies of the world. Again, Ricardo would turn in his grave he was, if he was seeing how he is quoted. And then Charles Darwin, you know, I used to be a professor of biology and know a, a bit more about Darwin. But certainly for him it was clear that the competition was essentially local. And for him, geographical borders, or geological borders like the Alps or the Himalaya or so, were helpful for evolution. On the Galapagos Islands, he saw 
that all birds, except for the penguins or so, were finches. But they had undergone an evolution over the last three million years or so from being simple finches into other species. And on the right hand side you see one having a cactus thorn in the beak, allowing the finch to extend its beak, like a woodpecker have done in Germany or in South America, for carving in the bark of a tree to get out um, insects or so, larvae. Okay. And Darwin immediately recognized that tool using finches with cactus thorns would have been impossible in the presence of woodpeckers. You know? The insulation, the isolation of the Galapagos Islands as a condition for a certain type of evolution. That's the opposite of what economists tell us. They always say you have to crush the um, differences. You have to have a worldwide competition. That's good for all, according to Adam Smith and according to Darwin. It's wrong, but never admitted that it's wrong. The Anglo-Saxon philosophy mostly means reductionist philosophy. That is good at dissecting, but cannot say much about life, the future, and complex systems. What can um, the um, philosophy, the reductionist or analytical philosophy do in understanding a rat? Well, it can kill it and do the anatomy of rats. Okay. You can go down to the molecular level as well. Okay. But what does, it, does that mean in understanding the ecological role of living rats? Nothing. So, responding to the philosophical crisis, we suggest in, to engage in a new enlightenment. Let's call it Enlightenment two for the full world. Human-centered development resulted from the European Enlightenment of the 17th and 18th century. On the right-hand side, you see Jeremy Bentham, the great hero of utilitarianism. Everything has to be useful. And everything that's not useful should be eradicated, you know? Completely mad, but allowed in the full world, uh, in, the, in the empty world. And in the English-speaking world, the Enlightenment is often associated with selfishness and social Darwinism. Thomas Hobbes, humans are selfish beasts, and they have to be controlled by the Leviathan, authoritarian, or authoritarian state. Okay. And then came Adam Smith. He was sort of saving us by saying selfishness itself can produce social wealth, societal wealth, via the invisible hand. The Wealth of Nations was the title of his book. And that was all right, as long as the law was coextensive with the markets. And then Herbert Spencer, a terrible guy. He was actually a brother-in-law of Darwin. He said, the state must not interfere with social justice. Evolution will render the state unnecessary, you know? Because the strong will kill the weak, and then everybody is strong. And then why do we need a state any longer? There is an anecdote about Herbert Spencer. He was invited to New York. He was an extremely famous man in England. And then he saw the immigrants, including many Germans, I'm sure, 
arriving in New York and uh, having miserable conditions, hunger, um, diseases, no money, and hundreds of them, thousands of them died. And then uh, Herbert Spencer spoke to his company, the people accompanying him, and said, we are the privileged observers of evolution at work. You know, that was his philosophy. I mean, we Germans have to be very cautious criticizing uh, Herbert Spencer because uh, Adolf Hitler was worse. Nevertheless, this is the wrong philosophy. But in the Anglo-Saxon world, so um, social Darwinism is considered simply a law of nature, period. That's the old philosophy, the old enlightenment. We suggest that balance could become a key notion for the new enlightenment. For instance, balance between humans and nature. What I was saying about vertebrates doesn't sound like balance. It's anti-balance or between heart and brain. Brains are very useful for natural sciences and, and technology, etc. But if there is no heart behind, it can be very destructive. It's essentially military. Or between short term and long term. Of course, if you are hungry or thirsty, you prefer to, to drink or to eat today and not 30 years from now. But if you are talking about biodiversity or climate or um, the grand philosophies, etc., you better think long term. Or between public and private. That's essentially what I said about Adam Smith. I mean, uh, for him, there was a balance between the private advantage, selfishness, and the public advantage by the state. So a balanced market is a good thing. An unbalanced market is a bad thing. Or between religion and state. I suppose nobody in this room wants an Islamic state or a Christian state before uh, Luther uh, with a corrupt Vatican and all that. Today's pope is hugely better than the popes at that time. But a state forbidding religion is equally st stupid. And, of course, between feminine and masculine. It's also very important to be in a good balance. Equity and rewards for achievement. In the political domain, you usually have the left-wing parties asking for equity and the right-wing parties asking for rewards for achievement because otherwise there is nothing to, di uh, to distribute. And both are right. It is simply stupid to assume one is right and the other is wrong. And still the two concepts are mutually, well, in a battle. Or between speed and stability, innovation and reliability. I mean, in business schools you always learn that innovation is fantastic. Um, the fastest and the cheapest is always winning. That's what you learn in business schools. And it is not exactly wrong, but it's dangerous. Western thinking tends to lean to dogmatism. One is right and all the others are wrong. This has been quite good for mathematics, physics, biology, chemistry, etc. Because two times two happens to be four and not five. That, out of that you can make a dogma. Mathematicians have a certain tendency of being dogmatic. Rightly so, if you wish. But if you talk about systems, including living beings, including humans, you better think differently. So, 
the, in Asian cultures, you celebrate balance. It's the famous yin-yang symbol. Okay. But the endangered world cannot wait until 8 billion people went through the troubles of a new enlightenment. We have to work now. And that's the third part, which is actually half of the book. Join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. But for that sustainable world, the new balanced enlightenment will be crucial, including throwing overboard some of the features of the old enlightenment, such as colonialism. When I'm talking with Africans about enlightenment, they get angry. They say, no, 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 no. Enlightenment, including according to Kant, has been the justification for colonialism. The enlightened Europeans have all right to dominate those uh, Africans who are like apes, you know? This is more or less the language of the 18th century. Or reductionism. I was talking about that in a moment uh, with this dead rat. Or pure utilitarianism. Of course, utility and uh, utilitarian thinking has its legitimate part in our society, no doubt. But if that is the only criterion, it's a disaster. Or the mathematization. I mean, I was talking about that in uh, terms of dogma. Mathematics is a wonderful thing. You know, when I was dean of the School of Environmental Science and Management in the uh, University of California in Santa Barbara, I had as part of my duty to read and assess uh, the published, the publications of my faculty, which I did. And then there was one, uh, I mean, much of that was boring. Everything was full of mathematics. And then I saw one with an extremely attractive uh, title for me, The Greening of the Electrical Utilities. I said, ah, oh, great, now I'm really proud of my faculty. And I was reading through it. Essentially, it was all mathematics and uh, you know, I was uh, studying physics in the first place, and so I'm not afraid of mathematics. But then I was looking through the substance of that paper, and it turned out that the central thesis was the higher the carbon content of the energy, an electrical utility would be uh, offering, the lower the probability of that utility using renewable energies. Now, everybody, right in uh, her or his mind, would say, this is a tautology. I mean, it defines the result by itself. But then, a cathedral of mathematics and statistics to prove this nonsense. And of course, it was successful, because it was trivial. And this is, I would say, 70 to 80 percent of the peer-reviewed publications in today's academia. Nonsense mathematic mathematicized, you know, including in, in economics. I'm not against mathematics, where it's valid. But you better also think of the content, of the side effects and all that. But they are typically repressed in order to get into the peer-reviewed journals. OK. Now, the positive side, a new sustainability. My friend Ashok Kozla, who actually served as my predecessor as co-president of the Club of Rome, um, created development alternatives in India. And over some 30 years, 
Development Alternatives created some 3 million sustainable livelihoods in the poorest parts of India, respecting the local conditions, but essentially ignoring world markets. It was one fabulous example. I could go on uh, talking about this fantastic uh, thing, but I, I leave that for it. Oh, Gunter Pauli's Blue Economy. In his book, The Blue Economy, he shows 100 examples of sustainable, hands-on, simple technologies using a lot less energy, water, and minerals. And one of them is stone paper, where he is essentially using sand and dust and plastic waste with hardly any use of water. And in China, where they are sh short of useful water, they established a large number of factories for stone paper. This is one example out of a hundred. So it can be done, but it is not done typically under today's market conditions. Then sustainable agriculture worldwide. In the Club of Rome, we have Hans Herren. He's a Swiss living in California. And he and Judy Wakungu from Kenya, she is now minister, uh, wrote 10 years ago, Agriculture at the Crossroads. A new edition is just coming out. And essentially saying we need ecological agriculture, not the kind of large size fields which essentially are monocultures and destroy biodiversity. And then renewable energies. Uh, I was quite proud that during the time of my being a member of parliament for the SPD, we initiated the feed-in tariffs law, Erneuerbare Energiengesetz. And at the time of our initiating it, the cost of a kilowatt hour photovoltaic solar would be two Deutschmarks, as well, prior than the euro. So it sounded like completely lunatic to build the energy supplies on solar. Everybody considered us crazy. But we did it. And in the meantime, photovoltaics is cheaper per kilowatt hour than nuclear power. It's unbelievable. Uh, some three months ago, a large electrical utility in Africa made an auction and invited bidding for producing electricity. And the winner was photovoltaics. Was more successful than coal, oil, or nuclear. That's unbelievable. But this is part of the story of the um, feed-in tariffs law. Then circular economy can also be very important. It serves also for climate stabilization because mining, transport, processing are causing huge amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and today, the world is not circular at all. It's perhaps 8.6%. 8, 8 um, Achim was kind enough mentioning Factor 5, which was a book in which my Australian friends, um, Charlie Hargroves and his team, and I proved for the four most relevant uh, economic sectors that a five-fold increase of efficiency was technically available. And the four sectors being buildings, it's a very large part worldwide, industry, transport, and agriculture. And in all sectors, 
a five-fold increase of efficiency is available. And I'm happy to see that German universities and Hochschulen are eager to work on efficiency increases. That's a great program. And then the question is, how can we make factor five, etc., and decarbonization in the service of climate policy working? And for that, I'm offering two far-reaching policy suggestions. One for climate protection, the so-called budget approach, I'm coming to that in a moment, and the other a ping-pong between energy efficiency gains and energy prices. The budget approach, what is that? The Wissenschaftlicher Beirat Globale Umweltveränderungen, a major consulting body um, di directly uh, close to the Chancellor, had the idea prior to the Copenhagen Climate Conference of 2009 to suggest that Mrs. Merkel, the Chancellor, would offer as a solution to the climate challenges the budget approach, meaning that all countries of the world would get a budget for greenhouse gas emissions. And the total would be within the assumption that never more than two degrees Celsius warming would occur, like the Paris Agreement. One could be actually more ambitious and then reduce the budget. And the old industrialized countries, here with red color, have already more or less gobbled up all their permits. So if they continue, want to continue emitting carbon dioxide, they would have to go to developing countries, here with green color, asking for permits, which we would have to buy. And that could lead to a total shift of priorities in developing countries. This is the Indian Minister of Economics. He is currently planning and organizing the building of a huge lot of additional coal power plants. India is one of the dirtiest contributors to global warming. But if we, from Europe, or Japan, or the USA, were offering him a large chunk of money for reducing their uh, carbon dioxide emissions, he would immediately think, well, let us define the range of profitability of that change, and he would uh, turn to us and say, yes, I'm doing it. It will force me to accelerate the build-up of uh, renewable energies and the build-up, according to factor five, of energy efficiency and the permits that would be freed by this change of policy. He could then sell to the Europeans. And India would get richer by becoming a partner in combating global warming. This is the ingenious idea of the so-called WBGU that was presented to Angela Merkel. The tragedy was that when she bravely 
in Copenhagen offered this idea, the Americans and the Russians and the Saudis and the Kazakhs and Nigerians and Australians said, no, we don't like that. Because they are living from selling oil, gas, or um, coal. But they simply hate the idea. For them, it is profitable to destroy climate. Not for Germany. We are ahead of the development. And then, understandably, the Chancellor uh, put it back into the drawer and said, OK, let's talk about something else. But we have now to take it out of the drawers again and make that a major goal of Fridays for Future. Um, a week ago, I wrote a letter to the German um, head of uh, uh, climate, uh, Fridays for Future, Mrs. Neu, what's again her name? Uh, and she replied very quickly, said, oh, this is a great idea. So maybe they um, make do with it. Okay, and what's the ping-pong idea? Essentially it says, make energy, or for that matter, greenhouse gas emissions and resource prices rise slowly. Each year, in proportion to the documented average efficiency increases. Then, if energy efficiency, for instance, for passive houses or so, or for um, LED lighting, would be accelerated, then the price for energy would go up. And that is a ping-pong of the kind we had during the Industrial Revolution, although for the Industrial Revolution, energy was not the topic, it was labor, labor productivity. Labor productivity rose roughly 20-fold in about 150 years, that's the Industrial Revolution. And whenever labor productivity was rising, the working class was able to get higher wages. So the uh, capital side could not avoid higher wages. They didn't exactly like it, but they accepted it. Meaning that this ping pong can have small success stories each year. But after a hundred years or so, a 20-fold increase would be available. And there would be absolutely no need any longer for any gas, oil, and coal burning. You know? This is the idea. I actually offered this idea to the Chinese government. I was in the so-called China Council, uh, head of a task force on economic instruments for energy efficiency and the environment, and the Chinese fellows in that group were absolutely delighted and said, this is the best we can do for China. So far, their success in the Communist Party and the government, etc., is limited. But at least the idea is there. And uh, my expectation is that countries or continents going for the ping-pong idea would accelerate the transition into sustainable technologies and thereby beat the slow ones. The new resource ping-pong could cause a steady increase, perhaps five-fold of average resource productivity in 40 years, and perhaps tenfold in a hundred years, or twentyfold, I don't know. And that was, would essentially terminate the conflicts between economy and ecology. 
So, the new enlightenment is still in a nascent stage. One goal is visible already now. Don't let financial markets dominate the state. Europe, Asia, and in a different fashion, Africa, will have to work hard and escape from the Anglo-American dominance of its outdated philosophy. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, on the whole 360 degree view and what uh, hopefully the young people, the Fridays for Future and the Chancellor or the next Chancellor in a year takes out of the drawer. And very optimistic that the Ch your Chinese fellows, that they understood immediately. Now the floor is open for questions and or discussion. And for this, um, who's uh, asking questions, of course, feel free. Perhaps the first question goes to the next generations. May I ask the gentleman here to ask a question, lady? Or critique, that's fine. Okay, Frank. Probably I didn't uh, explain properly. I am all in favor of competition. If it is fair competition, if it is under legal constraints, if the goal of competition is arriving at the best solution to a given problem and not in smashing the competitors, the others, because that has societal costs that outweigh the benefits from efficiency. Frank Hammer is our professor. He's teaching sustainable management in Schwenningen. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Yeah, Wolfgang, please. My assumption is, yes, it could make competition more elegant. Auctions can be very elegant. But the criteria of success must essentially be defined uh, in favor of uh, public goods, not only of private goods. The trouble with the two Nobel Prize winners is that usually, it's usual in America, they only consider private goods. But ultimately, I believe making competition more elegant under the condition of conserving or even improving public goods, like health, like infrastructure, uh, like schooling, uh, etc., uh, would be a great idea. Wolfgang Greter, next week we will have workshops with different faculties here, first time in Furtwangen, on quality innovations and sustainable development. And uh, these workshops will be headed by Wolfgang Greter. So I did an overview presentation, and he will, and the students will directly connect with the distinguished um, keynote of Professor von Weizsäcker. That will take next week place 
here on campus. And Wolfgang Greta can look back on decades of, um, of um, leading projects and innovation at Fraunhofer Institute of Information Technology in Bonn. Welcome. Lutz, yes. Dr. Lutz Bauer is here, a very close partner from Campus Kirche Fort Wagen. Yes. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for your strong prophetic input again. Um, um, and I'm, I'm thinking, you know, all of us wear these masks, and it's a symbol for the worldwide um, sort of new globalization, a pandemic globalization. And do you think that maybe this can be a chance? I suggest one should mention three major effects of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. One, big and negative, and two, positive. Evidently, the conventional economies are suffering, including jobs. Positive, is first the following, that everybody in the world realized, in particular in Europe, that it was completely crazy to let all medical factories go to India and China, instead of having some first-class, good producing factories in Europe. So, a certain specific critique of a kind of globalization in which only microeconomics dominate the decisions. So, that is intellectually a good move forward. And the other one is uh, the thing you are mentioning, that uh, nowadays you realize that many international communications don't need air travel any longer. Um, during the last three weeks, I had, I believe, 15 uh, so-called Zoom conferences, mostly worldwide. Some of them even just in Germany, but mostly it was uh, international. The day before yesterday, I gave a lecture in Nagoya, Japan. Um, and the other person um, in the ensuing uh, colloquium was from Hong Kong, and one was from America. So, uh, a year ago, exactly that same conference would have been taking place in, in Nagoya. And now people are kind of relieved, oh yeah, we don't need to travel. And similar things can be said about uh, other energy-eating uh, activities. So I'm basically, as so often, optimistic once we have a common understanding and the respective rules making the good things profitable and the bad things not. Yes, please, our international student audience. Well, my primitive answer is what I said. Once energy gets more expensive, energy efficiency would win. Or if carbon dioxide emissions become expensive, then renewable energies would win. But if the opposite is happening, as the typical world markets have been doing over the last 100 years, making everything cheaper, 
then the markets would lead to the wrong, wrong results. Uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago, after the Soviet Union had collapsed, I said to my friends, well, communism collapsed because it would not allow prices to tell the economic truth, which I believe everybody knowing about the Soviet Union at the time would totally agree. But then I said, my friends from capitalism, capitalism is likely to collapse unless we allow prices to tell the ecological truth, because that would lead to profitability of destroying nature. And this is our uh, present situation today. And therefore, uh, I consider the marriage between free markets and prices telling the ecological truth, the optimum, including for developing countries, including for reaching the 17 development, uh, uh, sustainable development goals. Lutz, please. Say um, they cannot keep, uh, it, 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 it couldn't cope with the German laws of en environmental law. law. And so they say, let's, let's look at that factory in South Africa because we are far above the laws, the standards there, the, the environmental standards. And that was in the late 80s, the early 90s. And until today, as far as I understand it, uh, it's still the same case that, that companies, big companies, they just can't play. Uh, and, and it, they invest in, in, in countries which have um, lower standards. And it, how is there any chance? Because of the, the, the analysis is fine, but how, how can we trust our governments to, to um, it's a very good observation, a very good example, and it is indeed a danger for the environment. But the globalization of companies had also the reverse effect in some cases. Mm -hmm. Namely, that they have their company standards. Let me say, British firm had a Manchester factory with very high environmental standards and would found it very inconvenient to employ people in South Africa not being capable, not being trained, not being motivated to do the right thing there. So for the company logic and also the company identity and the reputation, it can be very helpful to have the highest standards worldwide. I believe the Scandinavians were the first going by this philosophy. Meanwhile, also German companies tend to go this way. I believe if today's Bosch management was asked, does it make sense? Uh, they would say, well, we'd rather have identical standards because we will want also comply with our European standards and our customers and the NGOs 
could criticize us rightly if they discover that we go for the least ambitious standards. So, uh, I'm not altogether um, pessimistic about it, but we need a lot more international cooperation in this regard. And here, I must say, the current president of the United States of America is a disaster. His job definition for the president of the US is ignoring international rules and competing on low standards with the Chinese or with anybody else. Uh, I, I saw him on TV some three weeks ago where uh, an interviewer said to him, but what you are uh, currently doing will not please Mrs. Merkel. And then he immediately shouted against, saying, if I was doing what uh, uh, likes Merkel, I would be a bad American president. You know? This is a mentality which is destructive not only for America. There is still hope. <laughs> And the young generation can perhaps start with that insight. I'd like to conclude okay. by thank you. I think all of us can join from our hearts that you bring all your knowledge, wisdom, and energy in for our common future. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Danke auch. Vielen Dank. And hopefully in 2021, a year from now, Professor von Weizsäcker, we can look at the upcoming election to a more optimistic view on the political side. I'd appreciate getting the two books returned. <laughs> okay, vielen Dank. Vielen Dank. Jo, herzlichen Dank. Ich wünsche ein schönes Wochenende. Ja, der Herbst, ich glaube, die Sonne kommt auch mal durch. Und ja, dass wir alle gesund bleiben. Bitte. Ja, genau. Also es war ja Livestreaming. Aber ähm, es wird vermutlich heute Abend schon präsent sein äh, auf unserem neuen Medienportal. Frau Neumann, vielleicht können Sie es sogar online stellen, schon übers Wochenende, den Link. Wir gucken mal, wir laden es hoch und wird über die Hochschulseite dann bekannt gegeben, auch an die Öffentlichkeit dann über, über Zeitung und so weiter. Ne? Also wenn Sie es dann mit Freunden und Freundinnen teilen möchten, äh, liebend, liebend, gerne können dabei sein, was heute hier passiert ist. Herzlichen Dank.